BizQuick podcast hits on the struggles and advantages of being an entrepreneur. It's for anyone who's made the commitment to burn the boats and not look back. Are you a busy entrepreneur or small business owner trying to do it all? Then this podcast is for you. Corey and Julie will take you through the details of building a strong business. Hit the subscribe button and gear up for another episode of Biz Quick Podcast. Hello and welcome to Biz Quick. I'm Corey. I'm Julie. And you are aggressive again. Um, <laughs> I think you're just going to have to accept the fact that I'm aggressive on the opening. That's now. fine. That's fine. <laughs> so we have uh, EA Sulkovitz on the podcast Ch- today. What are the chances you pronounce that name correctly? A hundred percent incorrect. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. We have been on a streak of having um, hard hard names to pronounce. And uh, yeah. Anyway, um, he signs his name EA. We'll find out how he goes by, but. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, he uh, is the founder of Givers University, and um, we are going to talk to him about that and the difference between being a giver and a taker, and I think we're going to start about that. Julie, what's the difference between a giver and a taker? Givers give and takers take? Excellent. Excellent. (laughs) Yeah, and I just, um, do you think there's a takers university? I'm pretty sure that's every university. They just take (laughs) your money. (laughs) Fair enough. That is a, you're right, 100% correct. So, you know, one of the things that EA likes to talk about is his defeats. So I thought maybe we could spend some time talking about our defeats. And, you know, I feel like the easiest way to talk about that is gambling. (laughs) Yes. It's... It, it's one of those things you have to, and I, and I feel like gambling is a very good analogy for life because mm-hmm. there's highs, there's lows, there's, and, and we're not talking about roulette, which is pretty much a hundred percent chance. We're talking like sports betting. But roulette is fun, but let's, we'll yeah. talk about that in another episode. Yeah. yeah, sure. There's certain things you do in life that are fun, like roulette or, yeah. you know, and, and there's, I mean, some strategy to it, but not skill. It's do you, primarily chance. Do you remember the time we were playing roulette in Vegas and my sister was at the table and she accused the dealer of stealing $25? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, like, it ruined her whole entire trip to yes. Vegas. I was like... That's twenty five. You were going to give that twenty five dollars away <laughs> anyway. It was very weird. Hopefully, yeah. she's not listening to this podcast. Um, I've already pissed her off enough in the in the past seven days. Sure. What? So, I, you said something to me recently that is just kind of stuck with me with respect to gambling, and um, I'm just kind of cu- curious how you think this applies to life in general. You said you never go 10 and 0 when you're gambling but you'll go 0 and 10 right so yeah, you, you can't win them all but you certainly can lose them all <laughs> exactly so how applicable is that to just life in general well so funny you should ask because i'm in a conversation right now with a buddy of mine and we've been uh betting on the uh european soccer championships mm-hmm, the nba championships um and we've been on a, a, a rough patch a dry streak right now mm-hmm. um and he, he actually just before this podcast he sent me a text and he said how is it that uh we can like the the bad streaks always last longer than the good streaks Fact. and i wonder i mean if you look at like the account balances Mm -hmm. they tell that story but then if you like really dive into it i wonder if they do like if you were to look at a straight up like wins versus losses not money won versus money lost because Mm -hmm. when you start factoring in juice and the size of your bets and all of that 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 varies i would say by and large if you're just looking at wins and losses were in the positive and and uh for like football gambling for example like where the 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 juice and we're going to talk a lot of gambling stuff out there for people who uh you might want to go listen to a couple other podcasts before you get get to you can come back to this one but um to learn what we're talking about but like the juice like the percentage that you have to pay if you lose mm-hmm. and football is fairly standard mm-hmm. so if you are if you win if you're over 55 percent that's considered successful. Yes. 
when yes. you get into like soccer and baseball and hockey, not so much because the Jews can be a lot higher. So that percentage you have to pay if you lose is significantly, significantly higher. Significantly more. So for instance, if you betting a hundred dollars on a football game, you are risking a hundred and ten to win a hundred. But mm-hmm. on hockey or soccer or some of these other sports, you could be risking three hundred dollars to win a hundred. So it's it's it, you know, and and they're factoring in the risk and the you know chance potential for winning and all of that. So I mean, there's a math that goes into it. But um, you know, I don't think that we we recognize back to the the question. I don't think that we recognize or celebrate or give credit to all of the wins, but we sure as hell remember all of the losses. It, and I think that that's that's the analogy for life and for being an entrepreneur, right? Is that we do, and I know I'm really guilty of this, right? Where, and and I think we, we've talked about this in a recent, maybe in a recent blog, where we don't, we just don't spend enough time celebrating and thinking about the wins and really focusing on them. Um, and to our own detriment, I think, because it's important to acknowledge those wins in order to, you know, continue to advance ourselves but oh man do we beat ourselves up over the losses and on the you know we all we we can remember during football season i remember some of our bad beats right i remember some of them i can remember specifically you know so you and me and uh, my brother mark we do the um we do the um the uh oh gosh what's the super contest right yes we do this the the super contest and it is always um I can remember how good um, we were doing one year. I mean, we were we were in the money. We were we were doing really well. And um, the second we realized how well we were doing, <laughs> so much so that we don't even tell your brother what our record is because we don't want it to jinx him. We don't want to jinx it just because of the process that we use. Yes. Yeah. But we, I love this conversation, and I'm just going to put this little shout out out there before we take a break and and bring in EA. Um, I want to, and I know you will agree with me, Corey, I want to get a bookie on our podcast or a professional gambler because I feel like that would be a fantastic conversation for us to have. So we're going to, if we've got any bookies or professional gamblers that are listening, handicappers, let us know because we want to get you on the show and we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with EA. Hey everyone, we wanted to take a quick break to tell you all about our friends over at Podmatch. It's like a dating app, but for podcasts. This is a service we use to connect with potential guests for our show, and we connect with other hosts to be a guest on theirs. If you're an aspiring podcaster, have a podcast, or have something you want to share, head on over to podmatch.com slash sign up slash bizquick, or click on the link in the show notes to get started. All right, and welcome back to the show, everybody. We've got EA Sulkovitz. I got it right on the front end. Nice job, Corey. Thank you. Nice job. We've got EA on the show. Welcome, EA. Thank you so much, Julie and Corey. Thank you for having me on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to talk about Givers University and the difference between givers and takers and all of those things. Um, Our first question for you today is, tell us about your biggest failure. Wow. Well, I got to tell you, there's a, I, I've got three whoppers and each one got worse and worse and worse. Uh, and each one caused me to write a book. So my butt wasn't in that situation ever again. Uh, first thing I'd have to do is uh, I would have to adjust one word in your question, if I may. Mm-hmm. And it's a word that my business mentor taught me to eliminate from my vernacular. He said, get rid of the word failure. Do not use it. It's too eternal. He said everything. And he said, you will have setbacks, hundreds, if not thousands of them. He said, you'll have many of them. He said, but re- supplant the word failure with the word temporary defeat. And he said, by reframing it in your own mind, it'll help you get through that time period. And it won't seem as eternal and devastating as failure does. He said, so remember temporary defeat, you just got tackled. You're going to stand up and realize you got a first down. So um, it it would be a competition as to which one was actually the worst. They all, they had one commonality and that was my lack of understanding at the moment. Um, I would say the first, the, the worst one by far was the third one. Um, It went on for a really, really long time, uh, about 10 years, as a matter of fact. And it had to do with my learning about an agency known as the IRS. And uh, let me tell you, it went on. And this was a, 
and and this is my third temporary defeat. I even I even I'm brutally honest with this in the courses on Givers University on what happened with me. So I'm not sharing anything that's like some secret, secret, secret. I mean, I'm like totally transparent in all ways anyway. So after 10 years, because I had a, a, a very, very successful business, I had 20 offices in 20 countries, 33,000 people working for me. Uh, and it was in a time period where the government, if you weren't playing ball, uh, you were going to be on the radar and yours truly got on the radar and they were convinced I was socking away money in another country. We were doing depositions in other countries. Let me tell you, this thing went on for a long time. Uh, and actually, as a matter of fact, it went on over a decade. And I told my attorney, I said, uh, you got to get me out. I said, they're killing me. I said, they're going to kill me by the, you know, the cliches are cliches because in many instances they're true. And I was about ready to get killed by 10,000 cuts. And I told my attorney, I said, you got to get these people out of my life. I said, I'm just, I'm they're destroying, they're calling out of my vendors. I mean, literally destroying my business. And uh, he's okay, let me see what I can do. And he came back. He said, well, I can get you out, but you're not going to like it. And I said, okay. He said, uh, it's going to involve something you're not going to like. And I said, well, what's that? He says, you're going to have to plead that you did something wrong. And I said, well, what are they saying I did wrong? Well, they will agree to you agreeing that you've impeded the IRS. Because see, they couldn't get me for tax evasion. I paid all my taxes. And uh, so he said, and, and I said, well, what's impeding the IRS mean? He said, well, you're going to confess to over t uh, 11 years not helping them as much as they said you could help them. <laughs> I said, oh, man. Well, I suppose I can live with that. Everyone hates the IRS anyway, right? He said, well, you're not going to like the second park. And I said, what's that? He's going to have to go away and do some time. I said, what? I said, what does that mean? He said, well, you're going to have to go to one of those camps, you know, or uh, the executive camps where you go away. I said, oh, you got to be kidding me. This is going to eviscerate me. I said, what does all this mean? Anyway, I'm really compressing the story down, but the long and short of it is uh, we, we actually, there was a, an article in Forbes magazine on the top five places to do time in the United States. If you could imagine there was such an article. And uh, one of them was a place in West Virginia called, it's in Morgantown, West Virginia. And that's where the term club fed actually came from. <laughs> uh, Jane Pauley did a, a expose there. It looks, I, I'm not kidding you. It looks so surreally pretty. You wouldn't even think that it was a federal prison. There's no fence. It's 900 acres plus 150 is the compound. And it's so beautiful. And back then when there was the interview, there was literally an Olympic swimming pool, a nine hole golf course. And I mean, this was like in front. That's, and so the whole thing club fed came about was these guys are doing time, but they're living at a resort. Right. So this is the place where that happened. Well, when I got there, the golf course is still there, but only the officers got to play there. And the pool now has a building over it, but everything else is a literally, if you ever saw the movie uh, Stepford wives, where it's almost eerily perfect, that's how perfect it is. I mean, breathtakingly beautiful piece of property, rolling country. And like I say, no fence, right? So I do my time. I go to this place and I get out and uh, I think, oh man, I'm destroyed. They destroyed my business already. You know, I'm literally, here I am 33 years old, was the first year I earned a million dollars in one year. And I have two planes and I'm a commercial pilot, limousine driver. I mean, all these things, right? So let me tell you, the money comes in and out of your life just as fast. And so here I am. So I'm at this instance. And I get out and I say, man, they've destroyed me. My reputation's gone. You know, they just, I mean, they've destroyed my business. It's called every one of my vendors. And I mean, just there's, there's, there's barely nothing left. And uh, so I thought, oh man. So I cringe when I get home, right? Thinking that's it, I'm destroyed forever. Do you know, no one gave a crap? <laughs> I was shocked. I was shocked that, and, 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 and even when I was with people, I said, I said, watch this. How, I, I said, I thought I was destroyed and my whole reason for resisting this thing for 10 years and not cutting a deal or anything, no matter what it was, because I thought it was just destroying me. And I said, watch this. So I was, I was in a business and I said, you know, I just got back. I was doing some time. I had a problem with the IRS. I went away to federal prison. Ah, those SOBs. I hate the IRS. Here, let me show you what we're doing. And I thought, and I, and I'd look at it and say, they don't even care. They don't even, and, and it's a funny thing. You know, when someone sort of sees your dirty laundry, they don't, they, they say, oh, yeah, I don't care. He's not too good to be true. You know, I've got my own laundry to be worried about. And they're on, they're on to it. So I have to share with you, I, in all three, we, I have three books I wrote and the appendix of all three books chronicles 
my third major temporary defeat having to do with the IRS and how I was so shocked and how now here's the part that's most amazing of all of it. I can truthfully, I can truthfully say it is one of the top 10 best things that's ever happened to me. <laughs> Well, that is typically how um, we can look at um, defeats and failures and whatnot in hindsight. I, I thank you for sharing that story. Fascinating. Um, you are a remarkable storyteller. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, how much time did you serve? Well, uh, that's the other part. I got a, what's called a stacking um, because the funny thing is when the government comes after you, they make an investment and they use a lot of resources. In my instance, they had spent over $2 million in 10 years. So I thought, man, how, how does the world in this, you know, cause I, you know, my restitution wasn't $2 million on the first go round, you know, and I, and it was only like about 18 months, right. Total. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and because it wasn't, you know, uh, interestingly enough, uh, um, uh, tax evasion is more, you know, but mine wasn't, mine was impeding the IRS, which, you know, even people in the IRS don't even know what that means. Right. It, it's one of those catch all things, you know, we can just sort of say it and it can apply to anything. So I didn't know that they had planned on doing a stack and a stack there. It happens so much as even a name for it. And that means that if they haven't been able to get from you, the amount they have spent on resources, they're going to get it one way or another. So when, as soon as I got out, they come around and hit me a second time on the same stuff. Ooh. And uh, so I went a second round and guess what? My restitution ended up being right over $2 million. Oh, that's convenient. And, uh, and, and uh, so I, so total time, total time was just under five years. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Yep. And, and it, but, but it was broken up and I got to tell you that, but it, but it was just, it's surreal. And I can share with you that, there's a number of things I learned. One of them was if you shake hands with 10 people in the United States today, you just shook hands with someone that did time. Mm -hmm. You at least because, you know, one out of 10 have already already in that boat. Um, and I, I can share with you that the time that was great for me because I was in this place and I went back to the same place again, by the way. Right. I was able to unplug after all of my years in business from everything and focus on writing these courses and finishing these books off that I've always had in me that, you know, I can tell you, Julie and Corey, I never would have done. Let me tell you, try writing 1,200 pages in long hand, <laughs> three books in long hand with pencil and paper and, and be able to think about every page and what you're saying and why you want to say it that way. And, uh, and it became the, this give to be great series of the three courses became the foundation of givers university. That's awesome. Um, That's and great. Uh, based on these three books and they became three courses and so many lives have been impacted in a positive way because of my number big King Kamehameha whopper temporary defeat. All right. Uh, which, so which today, today's I'll, a great thing. I want to go back to um, the, temporary defeat um i also yeah. want to say that i think once you've been in prison you probably don't have a lot to fear on other in other areas of life anymore right that's pretty much you know takes away most thing most fears um which is a very good thing i want i i'm, I'm very curious of your thoughts on this i'm also very curious Corey's thoughts on this i think that um i'm gonna disagree with you are your mentor on eradicating the use of the word failure, because I feel like that's just um, softening us up for, I mean, life is full of failures and I don't think there's anything wrong with failures. I think when you have a failure, I think it sets you up for the comeback and I think it makes you stronger and it builds resilience. And I, I think it's important, me personally, I think it's important to use the word failure because I think failure is a very real world in the dic a very real word in the dictionary and a very real occurrence in our lives. And temporary defeat is just, it's almost like the um, softening up of, you know, what we've managed to do to an entire generation of kids that the to trophy generation where we don't want to, we don't want to tell them you just, you lost or you failed. So we're going to give you a ribbon anyway. That's, that's sort of what it reminds me of. I appreciate that. Um, actually, uh, 
we're, we're really saying the same thing because you didn't hear the whole explanation. All I did was give you a snippet of why to do that. If you heard the rest of the explanation, you would realize we're actually saying the same thing. Um, and, uh, hey, I, I'm the first one to know that, you know, we've got a serious problem with what I call the snowflake revolution happening today, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and victimization and the weakening of people. One of the things that my business mentor shared with me was every adversity in life carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. Mm. Not some, not a few of them, every adversity every adversity. So here's the part that'll really pickle you. And if this, if you don't disagree with this one, I'll be surprised, but your listeners is going to blow their minds when I say this, when we really understand what temporary defeat is and that everyone, not a little bit, but every single temporary defeat carries with the seed of an equal or greater benefit. Once we really understand that, we then begin to welcome temporary defeat. And not only that, embrace it because now we say, okay, I know that in here is the seed I need that's going to help me get to the next step and the next level up. So the supplanting of the word failure with temporary feet is not to soften its meaning, but to reframe it into a point of action to say, when the temporary defeat happens, it's not a failure that is got a period after it. But it's a point in time where now there's a seed of something greater that you must find. And when you do, you will rise far above where you're at at your point in your life right now. So it's not to soften it. If anything, it's just the opposite. It's to recognize the opportunity that is always, not sometime, I can share with you 100% of the time. I interviewed a 1,000 millionaires in two years when I had my radio talk show. I interviewed uh, three millionaires a day for five days a week for two years solid. And I can share with you that every one of them as a commonality had the following in line. They all said there was a time in their life where everything told them to stop and not take the next step. Everything was telling them. And a few of them even told me the following statement and used the same words, which was sort of weird because they didn't even know each other. And they said, you know, sometimes I took I, sometime I took the next step just to see what else could go wrong because I thought I hit all of them. <laughs> I didn't think there was anything else that could go wrong. And I just took the extra step to, out of curiosity. What else could possibly go wrong? I, don't, I can't even think of anything else. And yet the next step, when they took it, and they all did that. Now, these are a thousand millionaires. Every one of them found those seeds. And they did not cower behind it and say, failure, wham, 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 over in the corner. My life is over forever. But they said, I realize this is temporary. I can reframe it in my mind. I can relabel it and because I know in there is the seed I need that is the last answer. And then they become successful almost weirdly effortlessly. And uh, I'm telling you, these are a thousand people. That's not one or two. And the stories are the same. It really is astonishing. So forgive me for only giving you a, a snippet for you to respond because that was unfair with me to be able to say that regarding the word failure thing because uh i'm the opposite from you know weakening people and i recognize the victimization rule that's living everywhere today and you know everyone's victim victim handout handout and no one's standing up and doing what we need to do as individuals um and uh i appreciate that so thank you julie and i appreciate that feedback because that's important you know I, I i love it i love the opportunity to be able to explore more with people yeah, and, and that I mean the I'd like the adversity and the 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 opportunity there that it, it, it like I, my approach to life is is realism with a, a twist of optimism in there and that it, you know you, you grow up when you're a kid and you're told that you can do you can be whatever you want and then as you grow older you should find out that yeah that's bullshit you can't really do whatever you want like <laughs> you're not going to be a professional football player and the CEO and an astronaut all at the same time. There are some people out there who can do that type of stuff, but not, that's not for everybody. But the the problem is that, like Julie was saying, is is as people get older nowadays, they continue to believe that they can do whatever they want, and it's like, no, you have to stop. You can't be an astronaut and a CEO and a professional football player, but you could be really good at X, Y, or Z, and just in and letting go of certain dreams, or if you want to hold on to those dreams, just keep working at it. Like you have two options, but you know, sitting down and whining is not an option. That's not going to get right. you anywhere. 
But um, and there's a big difference between a dream and a wish. Yes, you know you can wish. I wish I did that, but the, you know, and the, and the dream can, can be much more crystallized than what we're doing, um, because usually, if we have a dream, that means we're usually capable of its achievement, which is way different than I wish I could be an astronaut. You know, I mean that's that's you know the the whimsical thing, the old Sears catalog wish book, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> you know from years ago. You know, wish I had one of those. Wish I had one of those. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have we have blown through the time today. So before we go, can you tell everybody about Givers University? What it is that you do? Yes, we teach something that isn't taught anywhere else. First of all, I mentioned your listeners, we love everybody. We love everybody. But we teach people how to separate the person who we love from their deeds, which we do not love. And we teach people to do something called discernment, how to discern um, and, and how to discern in the relationships. And not only that, we've actually broken it down into checklists to simply share with them these are the actual deeds to look for when you see people doing these things, these deeds, because we don't judge people, we judge deeds. So when we say giver, we're saying we're labeling the deeds of that person, not the person. When we say taker, we're not labeling the person, we're labeling the deeds. We have identified the actual deeds that a person should look for. And then by watching them do these certain things, should I pull them in closer into my life or should I begin to respectfully distance myself from them? Because when I bring them into my life, they're going to bring with them the collateral damage and they're going to bring with them the three D's of takers that we say defeatism, disruption, and destruction. So we teach people how to discern in relationships because today, you know, I'm a self-improvement guy. Corey, I know you are. Julie, I'm positive you are. I love self-improvement, but no one's teaching us what about the other guy? What if he's not doing it right? What do we do about that? And so we teach people to discern who should you bring in closer, who should you respectfully distance, respectfully, not nasty, but respectfully distance yourself from. Mm -hmm. The guy told me the other day, he says, mine is really good. I read a book and it said I should have five good people around me. And I said, you're right. Which five? And all of a sudden there's this blank look on his face. I just see, no one's saying, how, did, how do you decide which five? And that's what we do. We've broken it down to the actual things to look for, the deeds they do, and from that, begin to discern. And that's what we do at Givers University. We love it. Thank you so much, EA. Can you tell our listeners how they can find you? Sure. They go to giversuniversity.com, and uh, on each page, they'll see a place where they can sign up for our free newsletter. As soon as they sign up for that, um, we don't spam, so they'll need to confirm their ad email address. They'll get a confirmation email and just say, yep, I want that. Within minutes afterwards, they're going to get a free checklist that is the six arrows that takers shoot at givers. And a couple days later, they're going to get the 25 do's. It's a two-page checklist that actually are the do's that givers do and the takers do to discern and look and watch with that'll help with their discerning of their relationships. 100% free. We want them to have these things. We're Givers University and we're walking our talk. So go to GiversUniversity.com, sign up for the newsletter. We'll do all the rest. Great. Thank you for joining us today. We really enjoyed the conversation and loved your masterful storytelling. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in. And you can find all the information that EA just gave in our show notes. And if you're interested in working with us, go ahead and fill out the contact form or book a call on our website. We can't wait to work with you. And we'd also love to connect with you. So reach out to us on our social media sites, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I think that's all of them. YouTube. Plus you. I was oh, getting there. Sorry. And we've got a YouTube channel. So reach out, <laughs> connect with us, subscribe. And uh, if you need to learn anything about our business or find out anything, you, everything's on our website, sbpace.com. Yeah. Subscribe to our podcast. Um, and while you're out there subscribing, like us and give us a review. We really appreciate those reviews and all th those reviews help us. So we want to continue to improve the show to get better for you so we can get more listeners. And you can reach out to us about any topics. There's a form on our website if there are topics you're interested in hearing about. Don't forget to buy a copy of our book, Seriously Now What? A Small Business Guide to Disaster Preparedness. It's the number one bestseller on Amazon. We have a digital workbook download, and if you've already purchased it, please go out there, like it, and give us a review. I'm Julie. And I'm Corey. And this was BizQuick, helping small businesses across America.